Um, good morning. Uh, the subject I've been given to talk about are the challenges and benefits of organic production. Uh, from a farmer's perspective, it's really an arable farmer's uh, perspective, which I'm sure you'll discover very quickly. Um, so I split my talk into two parts, looking in three areas. I had to re read uh, Nick's, uh, two of Nick's emails to work out what exactly he was asking me to speak about, and this is what I've sort of honed it down to. So hopefully, Nick, I've got that right. Um, but firstly, uh, uh, just a brief introduction. Um, I farm about 2,500 acres in Suffolk, of which 770 acres are under farm management contracts. Um, I'm a fourth generation farmer. This is a picture of my grandfather standing in a field of uh, blackcurrant bushes in probably the 1930s, early 40s. Um, we converted our first block of land to organic production in 1999 and um, finished conversion uh, on our own farm and on our contract farms in 2007. In 2007. Uh, we're essentially stockless, although we do have a grazier who comes in and grazes our red clover. I've got uh, two full-time staff and also part-time help. Uh, we do have an income from some building rents, but the main key thrust of our uh, finances derived from our farming business. So uh, firstly, on to uh, the key agronomic challenges as far as I see them. There are many, and I'm sure reading the ones on the bottom there, you can think of a lot more. But these are the ones that focus my mind, particularly from Harvest 2013. Uh, when I first came back to farm in, in uh, 1985, my grandparents were alive and I farmed with my grandparents. And then about a year um, after that, my grandmother died and I looked after my grandfather and I used to have to cook him lunch every day. And uh, one day I came into lunch and uh, put a plate of stew in front of him and sat down at the other end of the table. And he said, um, John, did you see that um, wild oat uh, in the field at the top of the drive? <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah. And he said, well, what are you doing here for lunch then? Uh, and I sort of wish that I'd listened to him more because uh, my first organic conversion, we do have some wild oat problems there because I wasn't you know, really fastidious about pulling all the wild oats. Um, black grass, we've got you know, a little bit of black grass sort of creeping in where we've done some minimum tillage, but we're looking at addressing that. Uh, charlock in some fields, like everyone has. Uh, diseases, uh, particularly harvest 2012, yellow rust, halved our wheat yields, uh, uh, knocking about £300,000 off our bottom line. Uh, so that's been a bit of a knock. Uh, fusarium, uh, an issue because we then couldn't use our own seed, so we had to buy in a lot of seed. And chocolate spot is always a worry in beans, and I spend most of the early spring worrying myself sick when the weather turns cool and damp and see chocolate spot little lesions sort of coming in. Fertility, um, I put that up there because um, being stockless, we really rely on our red clover, and I have found it difficult to establish um, red clover consistently in the past. Uh, we've now resorted to put it in the spring where I can get into a sort of warm seabed and get it going, and hopefully away from the slugs and the weevils. Um, we import, being stocked, we import manures, mainly poultry manure. Uh, we also import compost. And the reason why I've put stockers there with a question mark is, you know, what, we're trying to build a more closed system. So that's something that I'm going to be looking at. Um, so hopefully some solutions. And I put um, up here, my main solution is stop farming like a non-organic farmer. Um, you know, I'm still sowing too early uh, in the autumn. Too many winter crops, too many autumn crops. I mean, winter wild oats are called winter wild oats because they mainly germinate in the winter. So if you've got a winter wild oat problem, just sort of start doing some spring cropping. It's sort of like, maybe it just takes me a long time to learn these things, but, you know, they're sort of addressing that sort of problem. Black grass also mainly germinates in the winter. I'm just doing too many, put, putting too many autumn cereals in, still farming like a non-organic farmer. Uh, looking, also looking at the organic seed producers trial, and they've had a trial on our farm for the last two years, looking at the triticalia and the oats, they certainly smothered the black grass much better than our non-competitive wheat and barley. Uh, and so looking at sort of taller crops in that second cereal slot to try and sort of clean up a bit after the more non-competitive <coughs> wheat crops beforehand. 
Uh, but all these things also, winter crops and spring crops, and also a wide variation of cereals also do, you know, spreads your disease spectrum as well. So last year when we had lots of wheat and had lots of yellow rust, if we'd sp spread a, you know, a better sort of spread of cereals on the farm, of course, we wouldn't have had a disastrous harvest because certainly in the trial we saw that the uh, triticale in the oats didn't have much fungal disease on them. So it's about spreading risk. And, and I'm going to say, actually, what you have to do, and this is just the most ridiculous business phrase you've ever heard in your life, but you, know, you need to get your rotation right and think about your market second. Because I can grow lots of non-competitive crops, which my local pig feed person wants down the road, but I'm going to end up with a farm stuffed full of weeds and then unable to grow anything on it. Um, the lastly, reliance on a monoculture of red clover for t fertility building. It's difficult to establish, so maybe I should be introducing a mix of clover, so if the red clover doesn't do so well, then uh, we can back up on something else. Uh, the, my grandfather, Gren, with his, his prize um, herd of beef cattle, uh, I think you know, we're going to be going in a full circle. I think I'll be the only farmer in Suffolk converting back to mixed farming, but it's just not quite stacking up. Uh, I think it'll solve many of our weed problems. Uh, I think it'll utilize the fertility building phase of the rotation better. It'll obviously uh, more effectively recycle nutrients on the farm. But probably most importantly is also um, en enable me to build a tighter closed system and cutting out the need to buy in fertility. So now I'm just going to go on to research challenges. Um, uh, I've, I've requested this little thing specially, and I've been given it, look, isn't it great? Um, uh, this is a picture of Wakelands, and long-term research into organic um, uh, works is, is, is incredibly important, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, we really do need to focus on good old yield. Now, if you look at this screen here, this is a shot taken from my combine harvest of the yield meter, and you can see there's a spot yield there of 8.8 .8 tonnes a hectare. Well, our budget is five and, a half, five and a half tons a hectare. And I know that you know, that is just a spot weight in the middle of the field. But I think we should be working out how, should we, how we spread that weight over the field by managing our soils better and actually getting that weight you know, across the field and into the headlands as well. And I think it's you know, quite possible that we could raise our current wheat yields from five and a half tons a hectare to six and a half tons a hectare with just better management. So that's what I've got to focus on. And I think it's something we can learn from non-organic farmers, like uh, controlled traffic farming, nutrient mapping, and then using those nutrient maps to better apply uh, muck. And we, we must put more value on muck. It's an incredibly important resource, and we need to know what's in it, and we need to know where we're going to put it. And certainly, if you're looking at artificial fertilizers, the non-organic uh, you know, machinery makers are developing these instruments to put on on variable rate applications, we should be doing the same with muck spreaders as well. There's no reason why we can't do that. And also, I think, more research into UK protein. It's something that, you know, the feed compounders want to import, and I think, you know, we've got to address that, and we've got to be looking more at sort of peas and beans and getting the staple uh, proteins right that we can grow and making sure that we can grow them more consistently well. Um, other market challenges, imports. Uh, you know, certainly uh, when a load of imported peas comes in, suddenly, you know, the price of our beans go down. And, you know, I would say that you need to look, check to see where your mer merchant's loyalty lies. Do they import lots or are they buying from UK farmers? Just see, you know, where, where their loyalties are. Uh, price parity. Uh, organic cereals are now only 30% higher than non-organic cereals, and beans are only 10% higher. Um, how near are we to price parity between organic and non-organic in the shops? And, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing for organics? Will organic farmers convert back to non-organic production? Or will increased input costs mean the organic uh, margin is still higher? Quality. Looking at my beans from harvest 2011 compared to 2012, you can see that there's quite a difference in the quality. And, you know, if you look at um, big operations like cam grain, who are taking in lots of different qualities of milling wheat, for example, blending it and then giving the uh, customer, you know, the right quality they want, I think we need to be looking at that organically. And certainly, um, uh, Joe and Nigel Wookie from Russell, and I've seen them here somewhere, are doing it on a smaller scale on their farm. Um, and I think maybe we want more of those across the countryside to make sure that we can get the quality that we're, our, our buyers need. Uh, but that needs confidence in the market, and it also needs financial commitment from our farmers. 
Uh, buyer relationships, uh, lack of confidence in the market means that buyers are now buying hand to mouth, which is not great for us for planning. But with um, the deal that Organic Arable and BQP and Waitrose uh, have done, which we supply our feedstuffs into, um, it takes the import section out of the equation because Waitrose are trying to source, as I understand it, more UK produced feedstuff. Uh, it takes us out of the market as well because the price formula is uh, based on three different criteria, which means that we all make something out of the deal. So we're taking ourselves effectively out of the market. And also, it's a commitment from them, and it's a commitment from us. And that's surely what we all want, some kind of structure to make sure that we are all going to benefit. As far as I can see, it's just a win-win situation. Um, this slide, um, I, yes. Uh, my wife slightly worried me when she said that, that Sainsbury's were, uh, were supporting the, uh, one of the main sponsors, but apparently they're not. Um, but um, I, 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 the, the thing that sort of slightly frustrated me over the last year is that you know, we're constantly, um, you know, trying to persuade everyone that organic food contains better nutrients and more nutrients and it tastes better. Um, and it's also what we get most anti-organic press about. And I'm sure uh, most of you in the room are much thicker skin than I am, but I, I found this last year actually quite difficult, the amount of battering that the organic sector has got. And, you know, this is two packs of tomatoes I got from my local supermarket. And the ones on the uh, far side are uh, Spanish, uh, they're organic and they're vine tomatoes. The one nearest to me are taste of difference, non-organic from Teesside. And I can tell you that the ones that are organic were orange, hard, and tasteless. And the ones from uh, Teesside were soft, red, and they tasted delicious. And, you know, and I just don't think that, you know, these were sitting next door to each other on the supermarket shelf. And I really feel that we cannot let this happen. Um, and it gives more grist to the mill to those who would knock us. And more, most importantly, it will undermine consumer confidence. So, so far I've, I've talked about the key organic agronomic challenges and some solutions, hopefully. And I've talked about areas of research that I think will benefit us. And also about some of the challenges of the market. But as far as I'm concerned, what are the benefits of organic farming that I see on my own farm? Do you remember earlier I talked to you about uh, the yellow rust that um, halved our yields by 50%? Well, you know, I was sort of going out to see my local farmers moaning to them about what an awful harvest that I had had. And surprise, surprise, they also had had a terrible harvest as well. Uh, also, their yields were halved. And, but the thing that always came back to me was, to me, was, you know, well, at least you haven't spent a whole load of money on chemicals and fertilizer. And the analogy I'm going to give you is two to to toy tractor makers, uh, Alan and Brian. Alan makes his toy out of plastic. Brian makes his toy out of wood. Alan's plastic is sourced from two suppliers. Brian from his own stock of wood, and it's also renewable. Both tractors sell incredibly well, and in the first year, they make both make a tidy profit. In the second year, Alan's suppliers see his new car and they put the price of his plastic up. Alan's plastic is also oil-based, and we all know which way that price is going. Meanwhile, Brian suffers the market swings, but he doesn't have to rely on outside suppliers to make his tractor. I just wonder which business model you would invest in. Um, other business benefits. This is a slide showing our uh, income paid to our, one of our contract farms. Uh, compared to the average results from seven non-organic farmers uh, that are contracted out, and it came from the same land agent. So it's a, it's a proper set of figures, and it's from three harvest years. And you can see that, you know, uh, we paid our organic farmers £38 an acre more. Um, so I think that, you know, I've established that you, the organic farming is a reliable business model, and it's also been more profitable. Uh, but what is the key message that I think is not directly profit-related, but benefits our consumers and society? Farming with nature is a phrase that you hear banded about by organic farmers and other conservation groups alike. But, you know, I think we do it better than anyone else. And I think that we can rightfully claim that our t that title is ours. I also think it's the strongest message that we have. And I think it's our a free bit of the buy one, get one free. 
Unlike uh, other environmental farming systems that tinker around the edges with margins and unsprayed headlands, organic farmers do it in the middle of the fields as well. I can see the bumper stickers now. <laughs> Successful organic systems build soil fertility. And, you know, obviously in turn, for the long term, and that's what we're all about, it guarantees food production for generations. Uh, we always replace what we take from our soils. And organic matter in our, cells, in our soils is as, as important to us as nitrogen, phosphate and potash, which is what most conventional farmers just focus on. I mean, certainly in the eastern region, with the current planning permission for the uh, biomass um, stations that are going in, into East, East Anglia, they're going to need 800,000 tonnes of straw. So my non-organic neighbours are not only going to be exporting their grain, they're going to be exporting their straw as well. And what do you think they're going to be replacing that straw with? A balanced organic rotation, a mixture of winter and spring cropping, a diverse range of legumes and cereals provides our soils with rest, but also our wildlife with food. In a national survey, the greatest number of hares found on any farm was an on, an, on an organic farm, and the greatest number of hares found in any field was on our own farm. And a year, a year ago, we put up a bowernard box on our farm, and within two weeks, we had a nesting pair. And then the, that nesting pair went on to produce chicks, and we got two more boxes, and they also contain uh, nesting pairs as well. My non-organic farmer, who is an environmentally concerned farmer and is in uh, HLS, but non-organic, has put up eight boxes and still has to attract one nesting pair. I think the, the benefits of real farming with nature are long term. The people that we see on the farm want to be, and I think indeed do feel part of that story. Before we converted to organic production, we didn't have a single request for a farm walk, and now we have dozens. So to summarise, organic farm is not only the best business model, it's the best farming system to deliver environmental benefits. There, there are challenges, but they can, in my view, they can all be overcome by better management. Uh, research, I think, needs to focus on yield while not compromising quality, animal welfare, our soils, and wildlife. And to quote a, uh, an NFU phrase, uh, I think that's real sustainable intensification. And finally, the organic market is weak in the UK at the moment, so it is imperative that we get our story right. What I hope I've left you with is that the challenges of organic production are big and the learning curve is steep. But the benefits of organic production for farmers, our soils, the environment and society are much, much bigger. Thank you. <laughs>